Join me in welcoming Mr. Umang Dua, who is the co-founder of Keychain. What were early remembrance of starting a company? But I think with a lot of founders, if you don't have a plan, your mind will automatically start saying, I need a plan and I need to work on something or I need to build something or I need to have some target or goal. And again, I think for the first time, I like truly internalized that how powerful the right product and technology is because innately, there's no reason to believe that something where you remove people from the equation would be better. Any founder who's thinking of building a marketplace, right? What would you tell them? The volume of marketplaces started, the volume of marketplaces successful. Must be really. Really tiny compared yeah. to many other types of businesses. Yeah. I feel like there was almost too much pressure being placed, even at business school or college, which is like, you need a mentor. Like, that's how you're gonna like, make it or figure it out. How did you get exposed to it? Hello. Before we get started with this episode, I quickly wanted to share that we are now a part of the Zerodha Media Network. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm your host, Jivraj, and today I have me a super exciting guest. Uh, my guest for today's episode is somebody who stays in the US but has roots in India, and he's here for a while, which is when we decided to record with him. Join me in welcoming Mr. Umang Dua, who is the co-founder of Keychain. He's previously built Handy, uh, which was one of the world's largest home services marketplace, which got sold to this company called Angie, which is a public company and is over a billion dollars in valuation and revenue. Uh, very excited to be doing this. Thank you so much, Umang, for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, no, I'm, I'm super glad because as I was mentioning, uh, I think your uh, background is super distinct. You're on this second journey of building a company, having seen one extremely successful journey, uh, one that most entrepreneurs aspire to achieve. So I'm really curious to dive deeper into your learnings, what you've seen through the last uh, 10, 12 years of being a founder, gone through, going through multiple of these, uh, you know, uh, spectrums, mm. starting, exit, starting again. Uh, where I'd love to start is, you know, you've done these different things since you graduated MBA from Harvard or you dropped out. I, I want to know, <laughs> yeah. I want to understand that piece. Dropped out, started, yeah. but didn't finish. <laughs> Fair, <laughs> but uh, no, I think, uh, how have the last 10, 12 years shaped you as a founder? If you can give us some context before we go deeper, would be super exciting to know. Yeah, for sure. So like you said, born and brought up in India, went to college in the US, actually came back right okay. after, oh, nice. uh, worked in consulting, was at McKinsey in the Gurgaon office, not too far. Uh, worked on a startup. At that time, I, I didn't even know what startups were, <laughs> me and a friend. So spent yeah. one year in India, actually trying to get something off oh. the ground. Ended up in business school, one year in business school. So didn't graduate. <laughs> so till then I had done one year consulting, one year startup, one year business school. So mm -hmm. not, <laughs> clearly not lasting anywhere. Uh, and that's when after a year met my co-founder and then spent the next 12 years on Handy, which would not have guessed it would have been 12 years, but <laughs> was a lot of fun. As you said, Handy had two very distinct phases. One was venture back, startup, product market fit, scaling it, building a team, uh, which was a lot of fun. And then the other phase was part of this much larger public company. Uh, and so that was, you know, 12 years of upwards, downwards, sideways, everything in between. Uh, mm -hmm. Ended up selling the business midway through that, then left about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, took about six months off. Thought I would take a year or two. <laughs> Thought the plan was to just decompress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but as, as things happened, six months later, got excited about what is Keychain now. Mm -hmm. uh, so started Keychain about a year and a bit ago, and the product itself launched only six months ago. So back in it. No, lovely. I, I keep hearing uh, from a bunch of people who decide that they'll take some time off and that, you know, the entrepreneurial energy, especially in founders is such that you can't be out of the action for long. Uh, talk to us about that. Like, what is it about, you know, building companies that excites you? What is the founder in you? Uh, what is the founder voice in you telling you that uh, prompted you to after 12 years as well, give it another stab, build another company? Uh, and also initially, like, how did you get exposed to it? What were early remembrance of you know starting yeah. a company yeah i don't know if it's a good thing or not like a blessing <laughs> or a curse but i think with a lot of founders if you don't have a plan your mind will automatically start saying i need a plan and i need to work on something or i need to build something or i need to have some target or goal and again you could channel it it doesn't have to be starting a business so i think again in retrospect if i had been like you know i'm going to spend two years learning how to do something new Maybe that would have happened. But the fact that mm -hmm. I was like, well, I'm just going to take it easy uh, meant, I think, three, four months later, I was like, what's next? What's next? And so um, 
I think that was a little bit of, it was a very quick journey between one thing to the other, which lasted, lasted six months. But, um, you know, I think where it comes from is a sense of like purpose. I think it sounds a little like cliche, but I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the like mm -hmm. urge to build something or found something comes from, which is um, you, you know, you start to see things around you and it's hard to like, no one lives in a vacuum, right? And so I, I, I was in India, I was in the US going back and forth and I started to see interesting businesses. I started to see interesting things and my mind just started working and then you meet people if you surround yourself with people who are having similar conversations. And I made the mistake or the go, well, however you look at it, of my old co-founder at Handy, that's who I'm working on Keychain mm -hmm. with. Three months in, we were like, you know what? Let's just meet a couple of times a week, no agenda, yeah. and we'll see what happens. And mm. that was probably like <laughs> always going to end with starting a business again, yeah. because if you're going to meet twice a week, literally 30 minutes, you talk about the weather, how's life, how's this? <laughs> and uh, then, and then to... we'd get into it and start yeah. discussing ideas. And so Keychain just sort of, you know, I, I, I don't think we could help ourselves. No, that's lovely to know. I think uh, it's important to reiterate, right? Like that's it's the energy that drives uh, uh, the starting up journey more than anything else. I I'd be curious to know from a very like quantitative lens, right? Like I I'm certain that these 10, 12 years of building Handy also seeing like a public company uh, would have been instrumental in shaping what you're now doing. Uh, what were some foundational decisions like uh, beyond the sector, etc.? Yeah. We'll go into that. Uh, but then as founders, both of you, were yeah. there any foundational learnings that you set out to uh, put in stone that you said like, okay, this time we're going to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they were. Uh, and it's something we've definitely either explicitly thought about or definitely spent a lot of time, uh, you know, this time. I think the first time when you start a business, it's, you just get into it. You, yeah. you know, which is good and bad. Yeah. You're just into it. The idea is all you care about. Then you start building. I think this time we were definitely a little more thoughtful about like, what's the kind of business? How do we want to build it? Who do you want to build it with? Um, and, you know, I think the, it's, it's like a Venn diagram. I think when you think about like what you want to start, one is like what, what makes sense. And the first time around, the what makes sense, I think for a lot of first time founders is just, I have this problem, let me do, solve it, which is actually yeah. a really passionate and good framework to go solve something. Yeah. I think oftentimes the second time round, it's like, this makes sense, but is it gonna be a good business? And why mm. would it be a good business? Yeah. Like what, what, what are some of the economics behind it? Like how is it gonna scale? How difficult is it gonna be? What's the strategic landscape? And so you have this one Venn diagram, I think that you're, you're trying to understand like what makes a good business. Mm -hmm. And then you have the second Venn diagram, which is our second circle, which is like, what am I good at? And I think the first 12 years definitely taught us what we're good at and what we're not good at. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first time around, you don't know that. And mm -hmm. again, that's a, sometimes a huge blessing because yeah. you just jump in. Uh, the second time around, we were very conscious about like, what's the kind of business we wanna build? Is it gonna be capital intensive? Is it gonna have a lot of people? Is it gonna be in a space that's really competitive? That's gonna um, you know, what is it a SaaS business, a B2B business, a B2C business, and then what would I enjoy doing? And so mm -hmm. in a dream world, you put those two things together and, and the, the, the part that the intersects is sort of the business you want to go start. It's a good business and you think you'd enjoy doing it and be good at it. And again, no one's going to know till things play out. Uh, but I think there's definitely a mental framework that we applied this time uh, mm -hmm. more than the first time, which was just like, go, go, go. Yeah, no, I love that. I think uh, there's so much leverage, at least outside in uh, fields like that serial entrepreneurs have because they've had these ton of learnings and you can be more, as you said, I yeah. think just conscious about what you want to do further. Um, let's jump into Keychain. Yeah. Right? I think it seems super exciting. It's still early days, like you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at a LinkedIn post where you launched the website and, you know, it's been like six months, January, six months. if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly so, six months. Uh, so, yeah, it's super exciting. Can you talk to us about like, so I understand it's a, uh, for the CPG industry, a bunch of these companies who are marketing companies and not essentially product companies resort yeah. to contract manufacturing. Uh, and currently, the ways in which they find manufacturers is super haphazard. You have to like scout a bunch, compare suppliers, uh, MOQs are different, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's the problem you're trying to solve for. So if you can tell us more, and also like this is a 180 degree shift from what you were doing in like home services, yeah. right? Yeah. So maybe uh, whatever foundational learnings you might have to say that, okay, this is what we recognize and this is how we're solving for it would be really helpful. Yeah. 
For sure. So what the business does, Keychain, and, and, and you sort of summarized it quite well, is package goods. So you start at the top. But anything you see in a grocery store, so food, beverage, ultimately cosmetics, beauty, anything sort of packaged on a shelf. Uh, trillions of dollars spent globally. No one doubts the size of the package good market. Half of that is not made by the brands. It's made by third-party contract manufacturers. Again, that happens with or without keychain. That's how sort of the industry works. You would think that you know who makes your product is like the most important decision a brand can make, which you know most brands will say it's obviously really important, like how the product gets made. You would think then like the ability to find a manufacturer, you have data or you have research or you have some tools because you know it's so important, like who's gonna make your product and you're gonna build your whole company and brand around this product, but yet how do you find the right person to make it? Uh, and there's really very little. Alibaba sort of does this for China and I'd say that's mm -hmm. a close comparison, but A, they're only China focused, B, now Alibaba does all kinds of other things. And so what we wanna do is actually pretty simple, which is, how can Keychain become the most reliable, easiest way for anyone looking to make product to find the right manufacturer? And that sounds simple, but it's a pretty complicated data problem. There's a reason why it's hard. It's hard to know, as you said, who can make what, in what packaging, in what quantity, in what like certification, like how do you make a gluten-free protein bar um, in a plastic wrapper in cases of six and make five million units of them. Like yeah. that is not an easy thing to solve. And, and so that's what Keychain's value prop is. If we can make that easy uh, and reliable, then hopefully, you know, it's not just, a, again, this is the ambitious sounding. It's not just changing an industry, but hopefully a big factor in a global economy because that's how products yeah. are made. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's sort of what we do. Uh, you're right, very different from home services. Um, but at the same time, sort of marketplace, you know, you're yeah. connecting two sides, you're thinking Correct. about monetization, you're thinking about adding value to both sides. And so some similarities, but um, in a way, I, I like that it's so different and it's a totally different industry, totally different people, lots yeah. of different problems, uh, but similar in terms of a marketplace, liquidity, which side do you focus on? How do you monetize it? How do you yeah. retain people, hopefully? And obviously, the team building stuff is honestly the same whatever yeah. the company is. No, I love that. I think um, it's it, it feels like the right combination of differences and similarities. So that's super interesting. That's also a good segue for us to understand like how to build marketplaces, right? It just feels like, uh, I mean, consumer marketplaces are perhaps different. You've not done a yeah. consumer piece. Now you're doing a B2B marketplace. But still, like... Marketplaces feel like the most challenging kind of business models because the chicken egg problem yeah. always exists. Quality is a problem. At scale, how do you solve for some of these things? Uh, you're not on two of these stints. Uh, would you have any any founder who's thinking of building a marketplace, right? What would you tell them? Um, so, yeah, a few things. Again, I don't know if they apply to everyone, but sure. A, marketplaces are hard. They're, they're really hard. If you get the flywheel to start spinning, they become exponentially easier, but yeah. that curve to get something to actually work and at every inflection point, there's some false starts and you have to sort of break through to the next inflection. And, um, you know, there aren't that many marketplaces at large yeah. global scale for a reason. I'd say yeah. the volume of, I have no stats to prove this, but the volume of marketplaces started to the volume of marketplaces successful must be really low. really tiny compared yeah. to many other types of businesses yeah. and also uh, it's also a winner take all market yeah, almost right? exactly yeah. invariably it tends to be because the bigger you are the better you are yeah. which is sort of an interesting model which isn't true for a lot of other things like right. if i make water or i make like whatever it is granola it's not necessarily like just yeah. because i'm a big brand i make better product correct um or even most SaaS products, it's not necessarily. Yeah. There are niche like players. Whereas with marketplaces, usually the bigger you are, the better, the, better the value for the person mm -hmm. on the other end. And so tends to be winner take all. Uh, I would say some of the lessons and, and lots of things we learned the hard way or interesting stories from Handy as well that, that I think come to mind immediately. But one, focus on one side of the marketplace to start. Like mm -hmm. focus on the, the side that you're trying to prove will find value on the platform. And mm -hmm. usually that's the side that's paying you. Mm -hmm. uh, Which could be supply mostly. Exactly, that's yeah. the side to focus on. I think mm -hmm. people make the mistake sometimes of saying, both are equally important and that's the PR answer and that's the right 
theoretical answer in the long term, which is everyone needs to be happy, but there's always going to be one side that's harder uh, to, to get on the platform or satisfy. Uh, and usually it's whoever's paying. That's mm. the side you want to focus on and prove value to them. Uh, the second one, which uh, I would say, I think it's a YC um, framing uh, or program framing, which is you do things that don't scale. Yeah. And I think Airbnb had yeah. a bunch of stories and we had probably too many at Handy <laughs> of doing things that don't scale. Yeah. Can you tell uh, us some? Yeah, for sure. I think um, there's so many. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to start. Like everything from, you know, the early days, like how we would get supply. So cleaners, handymen, electricians to use the platform. Um, we, we had this really um, funny story where this is 2012 um, and there's no Zoom. Even phone calls is not, you're usually meeting in person still yeah. then. And so we had this thing, which is we wanted the first few people on the supply side to be like really high quality. And so we're going to meet, meet everyone like yeah. in person. Yeah. Uh, and Craigslist was by far and away this like, Craigslist is like this online classifieds yeah. thing that's super liquid. And we had no idea what to expect. We just put an ad up, literally Craigslist spent $25 saying, you know, make up to $20 an hour, cleaners, handyman, electricians, and we're in Boston, like show up to this address at 2 p.m. And it was, Harvard has this like innovation lab, which is like yeah. a co-working space basically. Um, and we'll just meet in person, like no digital tools, nothing. <laughs> and we showed up and, you know, let's say we said Saturday at 1 p.m. And it's a quiet sort of co-working library like space. People are there. And I think we showed up maybe at 12.45, me and my co-founder, uh, and I'm not joking, there were like 150, 200 people <laughs> wow. uh, who had just collected outside this, this place. Oh, and we had no plan. We had nowhere to interview people. We had no system. Uh, we definitely didn't have any tech built out to like, how do we collect information? Uh, and again, it was insane in that we got kicked out of the iLab. Like they were literally like, please do not do this again. And you can't use this space for this. Uh, but it, I don't know how we got through the day, but it told us that there is supply. Like all we needed to do was organize. go out there. Yeah, we needed to organize it, vet it, figure out how we build around it. Um, but I mean, we learned something important that day, which is you just post stuff and there's interest. Like people mm. want to find ways to make 15, $20 an hour. Uh, and that was, you know, illuminating for us. We had a stressful day, um, and we could never use that place <laughs> again, but, uh, that was illuminating. Uh, there were lots of other things like we, I would say, uh, I don't know if this is a matter of pride or not. Our first, you know, after we tried some digital, everyone's going to do Google, everyone's going to yeah. do Facebook ads. How do you get like the next customers? And for us as a marketplace, we said, look, let's pick one zip code, not even a city. Um, okay. So we picked a zip code in, in New York. We picked the West Village, which is like a dense, young millennial, um, because we were like, they'd be great users of something like Handy. And we said, we want everyone in this zip code to know what Handy is. And again, the, the, the goal was if we can prove that these many users in that zip code would use Handy, then we could just replicate yeah. that zip code by zip code, city by city. Uh, and so we went old school, like street teams, like people on the ground. So it's a digital wow. product, uh, but we literally had six to eight people every day for a month, like on a street corner in a small, like it's like in India picking like one mall and just saying like, I want everyone in this mall <laughs> to know what Handy is day in, day out for 30 days. Mm. Uh, and we got really good at it. Like we made a lot of mistakes and by good at it, I meant like we were hiring like comedians, actors, they weren't just people like handing out flyers. They were people that would get your attention. They would stop you on the street. They would tell jokes. We literally had like dog biscuits under the, the table. So the dogs would stop oh, wow. and they would force the person walking them then to stop. Uh, wow. And so again, that's not going to scale. We're not going to set up these street teams around the country. Yeah. Uh, but it showed us that in a zip code, you can get the marketplace to spin. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think obviously, these are sort of, in some ways, random examples, but they each taught us something. Yeah. Uh, and it sort of gave us the confidence that, you know, if we throw in more capital and we pour some fire on, on sort of the 
uh, gas in the fire, we can start to make it scale. And so, you know, lots of stories, but I'd say those two, like I'm having flashbacks now, were oh, wow. definitely yeah. big early moments. Yeah. No, I love that. I think just like goes to show the power of like just uh, just action, right? Like you just have to go out there and execute. And I know it sounds simple, but when folks like you put it into perspective with these anecdotes, it just like helps so much. So thanks so much for sharing, Um And that also brings me to an interesting point, right? Like I think uh, a lot of the outside in perspective is that the US is a more, of course, we all know that it's a more developed economy, deeper consumer market. Um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is also, of course, like 20, 25 years ahead. Um, and so you, you've had the chance of now, of course, building in the US, mm -hmm. but being, uh, you know, from India, yeah. you probably have an outside in perspective of what's happened since then, uh, because 2012 is, I think, the start of the right. ecosystem right. as well. And we now have like 100, 115 odd unicorns. You're seeing that bit as well. Uh, if I had to put you on the spot and talk yeah. to uh, tell us about the differences that yeah. perhaps you've observed, uh, like what have you, what has your entrepreneurial journey in the US taught you about that ecosystem vis-a-vis -vis how have you seen India evolve? Uh, I think our uh, listeners would love that. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, this isn't your question, but I, every time I come back to India and I use certain apps, like, I don't know, Somato, et cetera, I am amazed. Like they are not just on par with like the equivalent food delivery app, like a DoorDash or whatever, Uber Eats in the US, they are, I feel like, better experience, better digital experience, easier to order, easier to get around. There's like 12 payment options. Like I don't know, yeah. you can do net banking, you can cash and delivery, you can do credit card, debit card. And the actual physical experience, the person shows up in like 15 minutes with whatever you want and it's mm -hmm. reliable, on time. Uh, and it's not comparable. It is significantly better than the experience in the US. Uh, and again, I pick that as an example, but there are other examples. And so I think the, the, what I've definitely noticed is the frame of reference has gone from, is it comparable and what's going on in the US and can that be replicated to like, this is its own beast and this can be better and bigger on multiple dimensions. And so I'd say that's to me been the biggest like shift. And you know, we're lucky we have our engineering team we're building out of India. And so a lot of really smart folks who have worked at, uh, you know, other companies, I said Zomato, an example, obviously there's like Grow, like the trading stocks that are like Robinhood, whatever comparisons. And I think people no longer think in the context of like, how do we replicate things or how do we like build something equal? Like this is like leading the charge. And I'm sure, I don't know if it's happening the reverse way as yet, but um, I feel like that has been a huge, huge change. I think some of the other differences are, um, I think, fortunately, unfortunately, there is no um, there's no substitute though for like time. And what I mean by that is like, as some of these companies do well, I think the exponential curve on founders is only going to get more yeah. and more intense. Which is the best way to start something is to see something. Like I'm sure there are lots of like people straight out of college, and of course that's can be successful in and of its own right, but everyone now at these companies that are doing well, they're seeing it. They're seeing the growth, they're seeing the positives, they're seeing the negatives, and that's just gonna produce more and more founders or more and more early stage you know, execs, engineers, product folks. Uh, and so uh, I think one big difference is obviously the US has had that for, for years. Yeah. Uh, and so um, the pool of talent, not because there's something innately different about people in the US than in India, just because they've seen it for 20, 30 Experience. years. Exactly, they've been mm -hmm. in companies, they've been around people in companies. Yeah. So I think that will start to happen. And yeah. when that happens, I think you're gonna have this whole new wave of types of companies and types of founders in India. Uh, I think the second one is scale. You can get a lot more, which is a very obvious point, but I think just hits home. Like the US consumer will spend a lot more. Yeah. And so volume, you don't need that many people yeah. but you can extract a lot more profit or revenue out of a user. Uh, in India, the scale is is mind-boggling. And mm -hmm. I think that's on, honestly great because it's forcing people to think at yeah. insane scale. Like in India, you know, whatever, lakh, two lakhs, three lakhs users isn't anything. That's not yeah. gonna build you a big business. People here are thinking crores and crores and millions and millions of users. Whereas in the US, you could go say, look, if I have 50,000 people using it, spending $150 a month, that's a real business. So you can start mm -hmm. to build a real business. And so yeah. I think the, the scale at which people operate, for better or for worse in India, has to be significantly higher. Yeah. Um, and so I think most of the differences I've observed are um, around just the depth of talent. 
mm-hmm. which I think will fix itself with some period of time and all the success that's happening. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, I'm I'm like truly amazed. Like my my mom discovered Blinkit. Yeah, and it's been cha- life. Oh my god, she <laughs> can't stop using it, and she keeps saying it's like a game. Yeah, she's just like I'm like. I'm, ordering things like I, I don't need and I'm doing yeah. it again and again and again. Yeah. And again, you take her and you multiply that by millions of people. That's yeah. happening every day in India now. And yeah. that's an insane time to be alive and an insane time to be seeing that growth, which is not happening in the US at this level yeah. of change. Yeah, it almost feels like at least the stories we hear of an Airbnb, Uber, Facebook in the US uh, and you know that right. rush of right. like multi-billion dollar companies being born in like three, four years is happening now. Right. Like I keep seeing uh, saying that, you know, I, I, I read the Flipkart book recently and we weren't there to observe that, but we've seen a Zepto go from zero to yeah. $5 billion in uh, less than four years in front of our eyes. Right. So I think that's super interesting. Uh, but thanks for putting that into context. I think when somebody like you reinforces the fact that uh, despite not having seen similar cycles, yeah. uh, in our first cycle itself, we're building consumer products and tech products, which are equivalent if not better to the US economy yeah. it's just reinforcing right. for the Indian dream right I think a lot of people are putting their faith on it uh, and when you you put it like that I think it just is a faith uh, is a huge vote of confidence so thanks for sharing um, uh, the other thing I think is this sense of you know uh, I think just this capital uh, the cycle repeating itself again I think goes back to just like a 40 year versus a 15 year yeah. ecosystem um, you now work with multiple sort of, you know, investors who have put in like large capital in handy. You also have new investors in Keychain. You've also seen like a public company yeah. with Angie. Uh, do you have any any thoughts around the like the other side of the founder table? Like what have what has your experience been by observing that side? Yeah. Um, any thoughts on governance, etc. Like things that, again, just come by being in a more mature ecosystem. I would love to hear from you so that, you know, founders who are listening to you yeah. can learn from that mature experience. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great question and I think something that people don't give enough thought to probably, but the the investors and the people you put around you, especially in people giving you capital, that's a big responsibility both ways, uh, I think has a often outsized impact on the success of a business mm-hmm. uh, and both ways. It could be on the downside and on the upside. Uh, and, and so I think it is a... Uh, really important decision like how do you who do you decide to work with it's you know your to some extent it's the the founders and the early stage team and some of the team it's th- their company and you've got these people who sort of dip in and out because obviously they've got other companies so this is not their one and only priority and so how do you sort of align those interests is i think a challenging decision uh, or, or it's it's not obvious and easy uh I think there are some things that we've just learned. Uh, one, um, everyone says this, but founders, people, investors who've been founders, or uh, and I don't think it's necessary they have to have been founders, but if they've not been founders, they've just worked with so many founders. You just know that they are, uh, and I don't want to say founder friendly because that means different things at different places, but they will empathize with how difficult it is to build a company. And I think... Mm-hmm. What you don't want is put investors around the table who are giving you advice that's just like, do this, or in this stage, you should do that. Like, that's not helpful. What you want investors to do is empathize and be like, yeah, that's a challenge. Here's what I think, like other folks, or can I connect you with someone who may have seen that before, or how can we be helpful? And they're asking you that as opposed to saying, here's what you should do in this instance or in that instance, because that they'll dip in and out. They'll say it, they'll come back three months later, and you've had to do everything in between. Uh, and so I think capital is super important. I think it's um, clearly, especially in this day and age, you capitalize your company well, right amounts of money, right people. That is a, whether people like it or not, that is a competitive advantage for a lot of companies. Uh, having investors around the table who I think um, can empathize with how difficult the journey is, uh, is probably the number one thing I would solve for. Uh, the other thing, which again, easier said than done, uh, people who've seen wins, like you want, you don't want to be ideally the one big investment this person is making. Yeah. Um, because that just puts undue pressure. Again, the combination of the person not being full time and working, but yet for them, this is so important and this is the only thing they've got. Um, 
is can be a difficult relationship. So you want folks, ideally, again, if you have the option, which is obviously a luxury sometimes to have that option, folks who've seen success, like success breeds success, they have pattern recognition, they have other founders they can introduce you, work, work, work uh, introduce you to. And so I'd say those are probably the couple of things that we've sort of tried to solve for and notice, which is just yeah. good people to work with who are going to understand what you're going through and then people who've seen success in their investing journey. Um, it just makes for a better partnership. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Again, a lot of like key key pointers. I think the the experience of having built for the last 15 years definitely shows. I'm, I'm hearing just, just very clear, simple, structural responses to things which are otherwise, you know, fuzzy yeah. in case you've not been through that journey. So yeah. thanks so much for sharing. Um, one of the things that I'd love to understand, and you know, you mentioned this in passing, that being a founder is tough, right? And looking at you, I think it's very easy to assume that, you know, it's all been hunky-dory, uh, the success is showing, um, and it's everything like, I, not not trying to glorify, but it's everything yeah. a founder dreams to right. achieve, right? Like start, get acquired, be at a public company, be a part of that journey, then start again, like raise tons of uh, millions of dollars and, you know, give it another stab. Um, talk to us about things that you probably don't get asked enough or like things that don't get shown uh, yet are glorified. Yeah. Um, so one, to your point, feel very fortunate, obviously, you know, lucky to work with some great people, investors, team. I think that that's helped us um, sort of, you know, with Handy and, and, and this new journey. That said, um, yeah, it can be, I, I think the early stage startups are a emotional roller coaster. And I can't tell you, like I'm doing it for the second time and you would think I have thicker skin and I, maybe, I probably have a little bit of a thicker skin than the first time around, but my daily mood changes like hour to hour, which is crazy. Like mm -hmm. I will get an email saying X, Y, Z, good thing happened. I'll be like, great day. Half an hour later, I'll get an email saying someone's not happy with something or someone you were trying to recruit is taking another role. I'll be like, oh my God, I'm so unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're at a larger company or you're not a founder or you're in a more stable place, again, everyone has ups and downs, but I think those are a little more like drawn out. Mm. Uh, whereas I think as a founder, an early stage founder, those cycles are daily and they're yeah. intense. The highs are highs, the lows are lows. Like in a day you can be from, go from, I'm building the next Amazon to like, this is not gonna work. Uh, and I think that's, probably the most difficult. Obviously, there are tactical things like recruiting and this and that that are difficult fundraising. But I think the, the part of the journey that people don't see, because you invariably will talk about the highs, like, yeah. oh, we're building the next Amazon, or oh, we're yeah. this and that. Um, but what you don't talk about is the moments of like, oh my God, that was terrible. Like, is this going to make it? Is this going to work? Am I going to be able to like do this? And so I think you're, you're going through that journey and you're going through it in a pretty intense condensed cycle. Mm. Uh, so I'd say that's that's tough. Uh, I think the other thing that's tough is um, you don't really get to switch off. Um, mm. Like you can try and some people are better at it than other people and there's obviously all kinds of mental tricks and physical ways to I think uh, try and do that. But at the end of the day, I think I noticed even by the end of Handy and Angie as we became bigger that I could, I, had, I could time box things a lot better. I could say like, this is what I want to do this week and you would try and get it done. And if you did and things went well, good week. You know, if you didn't, bad week. I think now when you're back to being a founder or any founder, that list is endless. Like it doesn't end. If you don't do it this week, it happens next week. If you don't do it next yeah. week, it's going to happen the week after. So there's no like, this is what makes a good week. Like your reward for doing good work is more work. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that can be draining because you're just going from, you know, all right, cool, I've hired this person, I've done that, but now it's the next thing. You can't mm. just be like, cool, I've done it, so now I'm gonna take it easy for the weekend of the rest of the week. Um, mm. And so I'd say those are probably the, the, the pieces that people don't talk about as much. Yeah. And again, some people, there, there's an element of it that's, that's energizing and you know, you feel when things are going well, especially the momentum starts to build and yeah. um, you, know, you can deal with it and cope with it and, and grow from a lot of this, but um, there's definitely moments where you're just like, this is crazy. Like, why would anyone bring this on themselves? Yeah, I can only imagine. But but I've genuinely heard this so many times. In fact, 
the more I reflect on the commonalities across uh, founder journeys, I, I often say this, that despite the roller coaster, founders are so driven by what they're doing that they're always thinking ahead. Like I've met the founder of a marketplace in India, like I've not hosted him, but I've met yeah. him for coffee at like an 8.30 on a Tuesday right. evening. Uh, he was still checked right. in and like it's a company worth like three, four billion dollars right, right, in India. Right. And he's still like right. at it. Uh, and I visited his office. He showed me an ad also with this, yeah. this childlike curiosity right. of like being very specific. Right. Uh, but no, thanks for mentioning. I think I, I have to laud the articulation again. I think it's very, very, very clearly put. Um, I'd love to understand, are, are there any near death moments or moments of like uh, insane doubt that you can share that come to mind where, you know, in the moment it felt like, hey, this is done. Yeah. Uh, but you came out positive. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, 100%. I'm trying to think of um, like... Which uh, ones? Yeah, which ones. And, <laughs> to pick and out of the baby. Exactly. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there, there's few dimensions on which I think when you're running a startup, you're like, you know, you have those moments of like, is this going to work? Uh, I think one for us was when we launched Handy, so this is 2012, um, it just grew. We were lucky, right? Again, right place, right time. Again, lots of challenges, but the growth was there. We, mm -hmm. you know, 2013, 2014, the sort of hockey stick growth was starting to happen. Yes. Uh, but it wasn't just us. Like that was when Uber Everybody. was blowing up, like Uber, mm -hmm. Amazon. And so people were just trying to be like, what's the next Uber? What's the next Amazon? And capital, again, nowhere close to what, what's happened in the last four or five years. And I know it's corrected a little, but it was a cycle. Like capital yeah. was flowing. Suddenly on demand startups, like yeah. it was Door all. DoorDash and Instacart also would have been exactly. same time. Same batch of yeah. like. Some, so companies. Exactly. Like 20, and in home services, there were three, four other companies. We weren't the oh, only yeah. one. And everyone picked a horse. Yeah. Like some investors obviously backed us. There were other equally good investors that backed another company. We were in New York. There was a company on the West Coast, YC company, um, you know. Andreessen Horowitz, Google Ventures, like great investors oh, wow. doing exactly what we did. Um, again, we obviously thought we were, as I'm sure they thought we thought we were better, had a better yeah. team, better product, et cetera. But same space, same mm -hmm. time, same capital, gunning for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and it's hard not to get swayed. And suddenly you have two, three other companies and everyone is saying things like winner takes all yeah. and everyone's trying to find their horse and you're reading like press articles. Again, you try and ignore some of the press and PR where, you know, suddenly someone gets an article saying like, oh my God, they're killing it. They're winning in this space. And they've you're raised like, this much exactly, capital. They've raised this much <laughs> capital and they've expanded to X countries and Y, whatever. Uh, and again, some of it is you know, in retrospect, vanity metrics that may or may not matter. But when you're caught up in it, you're definitely like, oh, my sure. God, like we're losing and we're, we're not going to like be the ones that, that make it. Uh, and I, I remember like uh, with that company, like a very specific, um, very prominent VC, uh, like extremely prominent, I, I won't share the name, but posted a graph of their revenue and said, um, this company, I've never seen, and he is an investor in companies like Airbnb, et cetera, and posted a graph saying, I've never seen a company grow this fast and just showing their revenue. And that went viral. And I knew like everyone, yeah. like he said what the company's name was. Uh, and again, it's so silly, but like that definitely was a massive, like we were just like, oh my God, are these guys just absolutely killing it? And should we like call it a day? And like, you yeah. know, we're just burning so much capital and we're going to lose this race. Again, it didn't end up happening that way. Um, you know, luckily, um, again, we, you know, we'd like to think it's for a number of reasons, but you have all these, like that's one moment I clearly remember reading and be like, oh my God, we've lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are others around fundraising. Fundraising is always a beast. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's always a, when you get a no, it's hard not to be like, all right, why did that person? Is there something this person is saying that is true about why they wouldn't invest? Yeah. Uh, and again, you then go back and to your point, you have such unwavering, hopefully like in the macro scheme, you're like, no, they're wrong. I'm right. They should yeah. invest. And you have to believe that as a founder. Uh, but there are moments when people are like, no, I'd like to pass or I'm not going to do this. You're definitely like, hmm. Like, mm. I wonder why. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and especially for marketplaces, right? Because you're growing, exactly. you're burning capital, you want to gain market share, and, and you know you have only limited runway. So uh, that must have been a crazy challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And to raise, again, we raised a fair amount of capital. Some 180, 200 million through yeah, the Yeah, in like a 
pretty defined three, four year period. Yeah. Um, and so you're always out there. You're sort of constantly fundraising. And so uh, it's good and bad to put yourself in that position means you need capital. And so you're, you're constantly on the treadmill. So that was mm. definitely a stressful three or four years. Wow, wow. I, I want to know so much <laughs> more and hopefully I get to know the name of the fund yeah. <laughs> post the conversation. But uh, uh, we, dig we digress for a bit, right? Like maybe let's go back to the handy journey yeah. again. And for those who uh, we, we know, is, is Urban Company a fair comparison in India? Um, yeah. I think the model is different. The model is different, they, different they but similar space, more correct, or less, correct. right? Like, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, just for a reference yeah. point, right? Like, so Urban Company is a good comparison for what Handy was doing in the US. Um, uh, but that was more discovery led. Right. That was more gig economy right. focused. Um, and you also mentioned that, you know, you had that hockey stick growth. Like, what is PMF or like, what is this like shout for uh, this is working really look like for a marketplace, if you can maybe mention that. And also, since you were connecting this gig economy, you probably weren't as familiar with the gig economy of the US, right? right. So what was the what were these early interactions like? You just mentioned that, you know, the 150, 200 people yeah. that came. But what are finer insights from the zero to one journey of Handy? Uh, I think it'll be nice to just uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes, go deeper into the yeah. Handy journey. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think product market fit is a super interesting concept. And obviously, um, you know, I've been fortunate to be an investor, angel investor in a bunch of companies as well, mm -hmm. some marketplaces. And so um, just observing like the end grow a little bit and understanding when you have it and when you don't and when you double down and when you need to keep it rating. It's definitely a art more than a science. Like I wish there was like one metric and people will say things like LTV to CAC. And that's true. To some extent, you can boil it down to like numbers and equation, but then you don't know you know, is it going to scale? And is your CAC mm -hmm. going to explode? Is your LTV going to drop? Is, you know, there are all kinds of assumptions. And so I would say it's more of a, which is a weird thing to say, but it's more of a feeling than a metric. Like mm -hmm. if I had to put it on a spectrum of like, what's sure. the metric and what's the feeling? It's, it's definitely closer to that. And what it truly is, is it, it, it's basically asking like, are you solving a problem that people will pay you money for? And again, if you extrapolate, the secondary question is, are they enough of these people? Right. Um, and it's hard to answer that because every day you're getting signals, right? You're like running this, you're heads down, you're so in the weeds. Yeah. Um, and every day you're getting signal like and, and noise like from one way or the other trying to tell you like, would someone value this? Would they pay for it? Because you, at the end of the day, you need to make money. If you gave everything away for free, you'd have product mm -hmm. market fit, but you don't really have a business. Uh, and then there's the secondary layer was like, is there enough of this to like build a venture back business? You can always build a lifestyle business and yeah. take it slowly, but I'm, I'm talking more sort of a venture scale sort of growth stage business. And so uh, I think it handy sort of isolating uh, sort of how we thought about it. For us, it was a series of questions that we tried to prove in the shortest period we could. And again, in hindsight, I think it's a little more crystallized when we were in it. I don't think it was as like, this is the question, this is the moment. Sure. Um, but I think the first question that we were trying to prove was very simple, which is would people, which in 2012 was a real thing, 2013, would people take their credit card out and put it online and let someone they don't know into their home? Mm. Now that happens. People mm. stay in Airbnbs and that, but at, it was not obvious. Like every investor asked us, why would I let this person into my home? Like, I don't know who they are. I'm going to go mm. on your site. I'm going to trust someone coming for three hours into my home. Mm. Uh, and so that was the first product. Like, will people even do that? Because if they didn't do it, it didn't matter what the economics were. It didn't matter supply, whatever. Uh, and so we, we literally had um, a website that looked super cool and tech, but it was nothing. It was literally like a loader. <laughs> Uh, like you would, because we were just trying to prove like, would people take out their credit card? And so we would say, you know, home cleaning, three hours, whatever it is. And then we had this cycle that we still like spinning and it was like finding nearby providers, optimizing your experience, like mm -hmm. confirming nothing was happening. It was like a 60 <laughs> seconds hard coded timer we had put in. Mm -hmm. uh, and then literally we'd get an email and we'd scramble to get someone to the person's house, like at the time they said. Uh, but again, for us, the product market fit on that was just like, can we get enough people to prove to us mm -hmm. that this is something they will do in that moment in time? And once that started to happen, um, then we got into, I would say, some of the more nuance. We at least knew people care. Mm -hmm. uh, and that told us there is some baseline of business. Now, I'd say if you can prove that people care and they'll pay you for some sort of service, I think you've 
taken a lot of the risk out of the business. What you've not proved then is how big is this? What are the economics? And I'd say that's almost a secondary. That's when, you know, call it year three, year four, we were like, what's retention? Like, how do we, Mm. you know, scale this? And how do we like, what do the economics of the business look like? Uh, But I'd say for us, product market fit boiled down to just like, will people let people into their homes? And if they do that, and conversion was decently strong, not one person, but there felt like a sort of people we didn't know. And it's really interesting because in a, in a new business, the first 10, 20, 50, 100 people, you'll be like, oh, that's a friend. Or you'll LinkedIn the person, you'll be like, that's a friend of a friend. And so that really doesn't count. But when you start to see random people use your product, mm. and you know, we saw it, whatever, a few months in, we were just like, wow, no one knows this person. They just found it. They went to the site. They took out their credit card and they trusted this whole thing. That's when you start to feel the legs on it mm. start to work. Uh, and so I think that was, um, for us, that was for better or for worse, like a pretty simple question. And then some of the more complicated questions came. Uh, and um, similar with Keychain, like at Keychain, we, um, we, we sort of had two questions, which is, will brands and retailers looking for manufacturing, will they find value in the data? Or is this not valuable to them? And I think very quickly we realized it is of value to them. Like we've got some very sophisticated large brands that have their own, you know, millions of dollars spent on operations using Keychain to find manufacturers. And that gives us, again, it's not perfect, but it gives us a lot of confidence that if we invest in the data and the product, it's only going to get better. Um, And so if they weren't using it, we would be back to square one. I don't think it made sense to keep, we would have to pivot, figure out other things. But the fact that they're using it tells us that, look, we'll figure out the business model on the other end, because if millions of people start to look for products, Mm -hmm. you have to believe that there is value here. Now, how we extract that value, how we price it, how we scale it, all things we need to go figure out. Uh, But I think just asking yourself, like, do people care? And will will you cross some sort of hurdle at, like, some scale is, I'd say, the art of product market fit, which again, in retrospect, is easy to say when you're in it is harder. Yeah, no, I can imagine. But but that, I think, again, puts it into really, really good context. Uh, I think the best definition I've heard is, do you have more demand that you can service? Uh, and I think that just means you have some sort of like uh, PMF, but this is like a very helpful framework. Um, uh, on, the, on the gig worker side, right? Like as you were trying to scale, and in this case also, were you trying to solve for supply? Uh, and was it the challenge to, let's say, as you were scaling, uh, to manage and onboard really high quality supply and, and then ensure that they get like there's higher customer attention, whatnot. What was the one to 10 journey like to say that, okay, now this is working. We'll figure out how to solve yeah. for supply. Yeah. Especially when you, I mean, the obvious question here is like, how did you build empathy enough to solve for uh, the supply side having a great experience? Yeah. Um, that was a journey. I think it, it it's a journey on multiple dimensions in that, I guess just to, we had a very manual process. Okay. Uh, and again, maybe this goes back to the do things that don't scale. Maybe it goes back to the moment in time in 2013, 14. Maybe it goes back to just the speed at which we were trying to execute where we were like, just solve the problems manually and we'll build it, the tools and things like that. And so we went, I'd say in a one year period from offices in three countries, call like it 28, 30 different offices, people on the ground, physically meeting, you know, supply, yeah. onboarding, checking licenses, background checks to a fully digital automated onboarding um, where we didn't need people on the ground. And how do you do that in a way that enhances quality versus and obviously lowers costs? Uh, and I think that whole journey to me was, even though that happened a few years into Handy, was sort of really illuminating in that. I think for the first time, I like truly internalized that like technology, like how powerful the right product and technology is, Mm -hmm. because innately, there's no reason to believe that something where you remove people from the equation would be better, not just more cost effective. Like that feels a little counterintuitive because I think all our gut reactions is like, if you don't meet the person and you don't verify certain things and you don't do it and you don't ask the questions, then it may not be as good as if you put in all that work. And the reality is, um, again, there's always a role for people. So this is not a a statement on like, but technology scales in a way that people just don't. Mm. Uh, And, that's the beauty of some of these tech businesses, which is they build 
beautiful product. They solved the right problems. Again, not trying to say we did all of that in, in such a uh, seamless way, but that lesson where suddenly we had built, like there was no variation, it was standardized. It was, you could put people on some of the higher touch to your point, like empathy, when someone has a problem, like keep your people for those instances as opposed to some of the manual stuff that's happening. And so um, I think that journey in the supply side was personally for me, like a just this six month crash course on how powerful product and technology can be that people on the outside may not, you know, you'd look at handy and some people would be like, this is not a tech business. Like yeah. there's a people coming to my house to repair my whatever TV or whatever it is. And the reality is it was a deeply technical business because we couldn't have done a third of what we did, uh, I think, without some of these things that were happening in the back end. And I forget, one of our investors told us like the best companies are like a duck on water, which is on the surface, if you're looking at a duck, super calm, just sort of swimming, but like under the water, the feet are like paddling like crazy mm -hmm. and it's all hands on deck, on frantic. Uh, and I think that's honestly some of the like, technology that's happening underneath that people don't see to make the experience sort of seamless. Sure. No, that's a, that's a great analogy again. And again, I think some of these basic things, as you rightly mentioned, maybe as a consumer, we just get to experience the product in and of itself, but we forget the impact uh, of the technology in and of itself to grow supply, to really make things happen because we take it for granted, right? right? We can't imagine right. a world without it. So that's super impactful. Um, but now, so years into the journey, you've made like a lot of impact, scale is high, growth is great, uh, but then, you know, the acquisition happens and then you're a part of this public journey, you've seen massive scale, if I'm not wrong, some billion dollars plus in revenue, mm -hmm. large market cap. Talk to us about maybe the acquisition piece, like what was the conversation that led to it or, you yeah. know, uh, how did that happen? Yeah. And then the Angie journey. Yeah, reflecting back, obviously, it's been a few years now. Uh, uh, this is 2017-18. This is end 2018, okay. mid-10-2018. Um, I think acquisitions, like going through any sort of M&A process is a, again, like many things, is sort of a very um, intense and short sort of emotional journey where you're like, is it time to do it? Are these the right people? Who's the right person? What's life gonna look like? This is all I know, like my identity is so wrapped up in what I've done for six, seven, eight years. You've got a team that some of them don't know, just that's how lots of M&A happens. It's, it's not something you sort of go publicly necessarily shout out, like how are they gonna react? Who's gonna react? There's obviously financial implications, like who's gonna, how's money gonna flow? How much, where's it gonna go? How's it gonna happen? Uh, and so you work intensely hard for several years, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then suddenly in this like two, three month period, very big decisions and lifelong sort of impactful decisions are being made for not just yourself, but team, investors, people all around. And so, um, you know, we it's 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 a truly unique, I'd say, uh, sort of just process um, for us at Handy. Um, we were lucky in that we considered a you know a few options, um, and at the end of the day, um, IAC, who was this holding company that owned Angie's List, which is sort of the parent company that ended up acquiring us and it all sort of merged into into one company, they did what we did, but um, for a different segment of the market, and so there was very little overlap, mm -hmm. and so the, the the value prop for us that sort of then resonated was like keep doing what you're doing. Uh, but if we can combine forces and we keep doing some of these larger, they did like things like renovations and sort of bigger, like chunkier sort of home services. And we did some of the more on-demand sort of transactional services. And your team can stay in place. The brand can stay in place, you know, and we can yeah, build we can something more meaningful. Multiply. Exactly. And so, again, in the moment, like, you don't know. I'm sure every acquisition in some ways goes down with this like dream that this is gonna be better. Uh, I'd say uh, fortunate that it ended, we stayed four years, so hopefully that's proof that it yeah. sort of did end up working out in terms of uh, some of the synergies and some of the, the emotional reasons to do it. Um, and yeah, we ended up staying four years. Life as a public company was very different to a private you yeah. know, early stage company. Uh, fortunate to see the life cycle of companies just because you go from, you know, raising money to quarterly earnings and how do you prepare yeah. for that and shareholders and uh, a large team. Some of the team's been there longer than 
you know, I've been at Handy because Angie was like an old yeah. company. Uh, and so how do you work with people like that who've been in a role for, you know, longer than I've worked? Uh, and uh, so just a different scale of problem and challenges and volume. Uh, and uh, I'd say fortunate just to see the whole life cycle. And that's definitely some of what informed going back and doing it again, hopefully with Keychain is yeah. um, seeing, combine the two skills. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's super interesting. If you had to contrast like the things that, you know, in the first five years of Handy came in super crucial right. to you as a founder, vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, as CRO of Angie, the things that you had to do, like part of the leadership, predictability, earnings calls, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what were these like contrasting things that you built into your DNA? Because now it feels like, again, outside in that you have both those skill sets yeah. and you've lived those lives. Yeah, yeah. Uh... This is an obvious statement, but it, it becomes true at, at scale, which is you definitely spend a lot more time thinking about um, people and have you got the right person in the right role. Again, very important at early stage startups as well, but at early stage startups, I think you very often with the person, you're debating the actual underlying problem. And mm. that's great. I enjoy that a lot. And again, there's no downside like to doing that uh, at, you know, at, some scale you get to, and then you're like, look, it's not about the actual underlying problem. It's about, do we have the right people and the right resources focused mm. on solving? And is that the right problem? Yeah. Uh, and that's an interesting switch that happens at some scale. Again, it doesn't mm. have to be a public company. It can happen at a private company. Sure. But if you get to some scale and you're suddenly like, oh, no, what I'm not solving for is not how do I get more customers, but... How much should I spend on getting the right customers? Do we have the right person in the right role to go help solve that problem? Sure. And how do we contrast that priority versus the five other things that may matter? And so I think that switch is a little, as someone who um, a lot of people, I think a lot of founders probably want to just go help solve the problem quickly and they want to get to the answer. You have to sort of train yourself to be like, all right, that's not actually the problem. The problem is something mm -hmm. else if it's not working. Uh, so I'd say that was probably the biggest uh, biggest change. And I think the second uh, sort of big change that starts to happen is um, you are constantly balancing sort of economics with growth. Like that is a trade-off that starts mm. to happen at some scale, sure. um, which um, I feel like at an early stage company, you can be more sort of one dimensional. You can more be growth. like right now, Growth is what I'm focused on. Again, that doesn't mean you don't care about economics, but I think it's almost a little easier to just align the whole company on one metric, one. And it's so exhilarating when that starts to happen, uh, where you're like, look, all we care about right now is more users, or what we care about right now is, and it can be, it doesn't have to be growth, it can be retention, and everyone's yeah. focused on one thing and they're aligned. I think at some scale that starts to break down. Uh, you can obviously have macro goals and stuff like that, but you're thinking in, in, in silos a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and so, that's just, a, again, a mental change that as uh, you know, someone in whatever leadership role, you have to sort of train yourself to be like, all right, I can't just be like, there's one metric that matters now. There's a few things. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Again, I think uh, lots of like, you know, second, third order learnings from some of these things that you're mentioning and very stimulating for me to hear as well. So I think uh, lots for uh, folks to go deeper into. Um, as we approach some of the uh, end conversations, I think one of the things that I'd love to understand and, and more on the personal side now is you've also, like before building institutions by yourself, attended like, you know, McKinsey, you've attended Dune in India, you've, uh, you know, gone to HBS for a year. Um, and people, of course, have played a major role. So what I want to understand more is like, like apart from the inputs that we put in, what is the, you know, importance of the energy around you? It could either be cultivated by the institutions you go to or by the network you curate by being a founder and, you know, learning from other people. Like, what has that part of your life been like? If you can mention any instances, yeah. folks that you've learned from, any stories from any of these institutions, I think that'd be really nice. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And not something I've, I'm sure I've thought about it, but not something I've, I've articulated. Um, I think the environment you're in is hugely important. Um, I think it is very hard Again, and that's not just true for, I think, startups or business. It's probably true for most fields if you want to sort of stay at something and, and hopefully, you know, have, have uh, impact. Uh, the people you surround yourself with and the environment is 
hugely. And, and some of it is explicit, like what you do, how you do it. And some of it is just, you're not even realizing it. You're just internalizing the energy and in people around you and what they're working on, what they think is important and, you know, somehow becomes important for you, or at least filters into your decision-making process. Uh, and so, you know, one fortunate, some of those places, um, like some of my best friends, even now are doing school friends that are all over the world and definitely a, a grounding, like no matter where you go, what you do, you know, some of those people. And I feel like, um, I think that's more of an Indian thing. Everyone has school friends, college friends, yeah, friends just, they grew up with yeah. in their colonies or whatever. That, yeah. And they stay true to and them. And they stay true to them. And again, if you don't have it, doesn't mean like the end yeah. of the world. But I feel like that's a little more of an Indian thing than, yeah. you know, which is in, in the, the West. And it's a great to have because yeah. it's like keeps you centered and grounded. Like I look at people, um, you know, my parents age and some of their friends are their school friends. I'm like, yeah. wow, how that, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but was it was it something specific about Dune that made it like special? In fact, like like I was telling you, Pratham yeah, yeah, yeah. last evening, yeah. he mentioned that you're a senior from school yeah. and uh, that was really nice to hear as well and that you helped play a crucial role in the outdoor journey he was yeah. mentioning. So, uh, yeah, that's that's great to hear. And I'm sure he was just being kind. But um, yeah, I, I absolutely think it did uh, have a have a have a real impact. I think of a couple of the things that I can single out. One, um, you you just get comfortable, and it's good. Again, a lot of these things are good and bad. Like yeah. my wife will joke, like I I can be I'm pretty comfortable in any situation. Like I go back to New York, I'm like, all right, this is home. I come to Delhi, I'm like, this is home. Mm -hmm. I you know go to the uh, good gown office or the New York office, different contexts. And I feel like some of that comes from school and boarding school and maybe uh, doing school, not doing school specifically, maybe lots of other schools like that as well. Uh, but I'd say that's one thing, like just like I, I think back to how we were just thrown into like school, you're 12 years old and you sort of live by yourself and you make friends and you have a good time, bad time, and you sort of, you're just in it. Like there's no out. And so you learn to yeah. sort of deal with yourself, with people and emotions around you. Um, and then I think the second thing that the, the school does well, and I, again, I don't want to single out um, necessarily, is there is a level of like, people value, I think, sort of the individual, not like where they came from, what their parents did, and sort of that wasn't really that important. And so I think it, it, Again, it's a very like 15 year old, like if you're good at sports, that also matters. If you're good at academics, that all that matters. No one cares about anything else. Sure. Uh, and so I think that that stays with a lot of people uh, in, in a good way where I think you become older and again, things change, context change, people's lifestyles change and things like that. But I think you meet friends or you meet people and you'll go back to like, no one cares who, like you care about who the person is, how they're doing, are they good people? And you care less about mm. some of the other stuff that, I think can become important as people get older, but I think the school does a good job of like pushing off. Nice, nice. Yeah. And beyond school, you went to like some of these, like you went to Oxford, you went to HBS, like were there any significant things that stood out from those institutions? Um, yeah, I think um, I would be lying. Um, and again, I think you can replicate that experience. So for anyone sure. like, you don't have to. Yeah, 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 you don't absolutely. have to go to HBS. You don't have to whatever it is. I think what these places do well is you are surrounded by people who, in different dimensions, but who um, are willing, I think, to put in the work and um, want to have impact. Like I remember first year, even though I didn't graduate from HBS. I remember just showing up and being a little overwhelmed with like all the people around me and someone, you know, X hedge fund, Y startup they had already worked at or like whatever it is. And you're just in that environment where I think you are forced to like just stretch and grow. And you, you start to ask yourself, well, not, not in a negative like competing way or anything like that, but you're like, well, what can I learn from that person? And what can I like, I could do that. I could do things like that and things yeah. like that. And so I think the lesson for me is obviously if you have the opportunity for, I'm not a big fan of like, you know, how people say, oh, you don't need to go to college. You don't need to do any of this. Like we're not lone rangers here. Like we're just the sum of the people around us. And so if you can find a way to put yourself around people who are hardworking, ambitious, think again, doesn't have to be the same field, but you know, want to have impact and, 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 and are willing to work for it then that will 
definitely seep into your own sort of how you behave. And so whether that comes from an accelerator program, business school, college, work, uh, or friends, um, it doesn't matter. But I think putting yourself in those situations is probably the best thing you can do for yourself. No, absolutely. Like, I, I really ap- appreciate you articulating in that way because, like, as I was, you know, researching, it just felt, again, like, looking into your journey that uh, some of these places would have shaped uh, you to become who you have and much have contributed to your journey. Uh, and it's worth mentioning how. So I think right. that context is really helpful. Um, I, I'm probably being a bit repetitive, but, like, any any mentors, people, I don't know how you want to frame it, but, like, I, I'm sure over the years you've also seen, you, you angel invest, you've seen like great people around you also be like super successful, right? Um, Are there any learnings that significantly stand out or personalities um, that you just, you know, have met or have gotten a chance to know who shaped your thinking in a positive manner? You know, I'm probably being a little um, atypical or, or I don't know if controversial is the right word, but I think there's probably too much emphasis in a negative way on people saying, find your mentor. Like, I actually am not, personally, again, this is an opinion of one person, but I'm not, like, I feel like there was almost too much pressure being placed, even at business school or college, which is like, you need a mentor. Like, that's how you're going to, like, make it or figure it out. And it wasn't like I wasn't trying. Hopefully, I was meeting people. But there was no, you know, if I look back, there's no, like, one person at work or one founder that I was just like, you know, that's my, and every time I have a problem, I turn to that person. And For people who have that, that's great. I'm sure it works and it's not a like saying that that's not. But I think some of the undue pressure on people saying like find a mentor Mm -hmm. or find mentors is, is I think can be a little misguided in that you're now looking for that as opposed to like what, what are you going to gain from, from Mm -hmm. that? And so I think the, the, the honest answer is they were probably elements of things in different places Mm -hmm. and from different people that I've, valued and I'll turn to or I'll get and so I'll think back um, even to like that one year I spent in the McKinsey Good Gao offices uh, again it was a moment in time 2010 I look at some of those crop of people they have done so well like they've gone on to start some of these large companies in India um, someone um, one of my bosses was um, the CEO became the CEO of Starbucks, recently left. Before that was the CEO of Reckitt and Kaiser. Again, you know, just someone who I was like, wow, I work with that person. I remember like being on projects with them and then giving me certain advice or whatever it is. And now I'm followed their sort of career path. Uh, and so I would say that there are like instances from people that I definitely value. And anytime someone, um, you know, again, I'll go back to has had massive impact in a field that I respect and it could be anything like I had a friend from doing school as an actor or whatever so not necessarily in a doing what I'm doing but a chance to like engage and ask them how and why and what they're doing and why they're doing it is I find like very energizing and so I'll try and draw on that more than individual people. Fair, fair, fair. No, I think that's lovely to mention again. In fact, it's ironic like just before this conversation I received like a I saw a tweet uh, right. and this person had highlighted the importance of mentors. In fact, instead of sending it to one person, I sent yeah. to like seven, eight people right. whom I consider really close yeah, and who yeah, just put yeah. faith in me. Right. Uh, and I think that's just great, right? right? Like, I mean, it could be a point in time, uh, but to learn from people is just uh, lovely. Uh, but thanks for reiterating. I think that's also a very fresh perspective yeah. uh, that's not as common, yeah. uh, but perhaps is the reality yeah. in life. So great to hear that. And also, yeah, were, were some of these like Ashish Mohapatra folks also like your McKinsey crew? Yeah, I think they were all there the time I was there. Oh, lovely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's... It's, it's interesting it's, how again, life plays small, out. Yeah, it's interesting <laughs> how it's played out. And I guess this goes to the point of like, that crop of people is hopefully going to go start or started or investing in and they're going to create like this much larger crop of mm-hmm. folks in India that are going to go do stuff. But it is interesting how uh, I feel like a lot of those people have moved to tech, moved to startups or moved to investing, uh, left consulting and... Um, there's like I just joined there's like a McKinsey WhatsApp group that is super active oh, yeah, yeah the McKinsey Angels group, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. I've it's, heard it's crazy yeah it's very active <laughs> lovely yeah. no I think that's that's really nice to know uh, that's interesting in fact so uh, is there anything specific about your angel investing journey that stands out like I'm, I'm sure like I've heard from multiple founders again that the fact that you were you've been a founder the empathy for others starting up really significantly increases you've also seen this 
insane number of companies start up in front of your yeah. eyes. So a- any any investments that stand out, any founders that stand out? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that I've definitely, like when I think about angel investing is you want to be available and as helpful as the person on the other end wants you to be, no more or no less. Yeah. Uh, a, it's not a full-time job for me. And so B, I don't have like a particular strategy. Like I'll invest in people I would like to hang out with and maybe the problem they're solving. I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. And even maybe not make sense for me, but makes sense for them. And I'm like, so it's not like a thesis driven investment or a strategy on how much capital at what point to deploy. It's more a someone doing something interesting and I'd love to be involved in any way. And then if I can be helpful, be helpful. Um, So that's sort of the, I'd say the the overarching how I think about it. Uh, I think some of the, the themes that I've definitely noticed is um, a lot of companies take time. Like it's just like, we're so used to seeing these breakout successes. And I think I look back at, it's really interesting. Like I look back and I guess that's why venture investing is always this portfolio approach. I look back at whatever, the, the, the end of whatever, 40, 50 companies and it's not obvious the ones I thought would do well are the ones who have done well. Like I should at some point go back and map like, you know, this is what I thought and this is what happened. And then some that I was just like, who knows, like totally outsized, haven't heard from it, done really well. And so I think there is at the end of the day, a randomness that, and again, I'm calling it randomness. It's definitely not random for the founders, but they have blood, sweat and tears into it. Uh, But there is a level of like, it's hard to pick. It just really, really is hard to pick. You can have a like a uh, uh, team, and overall that team or that uh, whatever it is can play out approach. Mm-hmm. But um, I would be lying if I said you know there was this one company I thought was going to be successful, invested, and, that and that's how it played out. Uh, I think about um, you know we. I would say a lot of our investments, well, my investments that have done well, were old, handy folks. Okay. which is awesome because it's obviously if people were to leave handy, we were like the best place to leave is go start your own business. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we were fortunate to invest in some and some of them have done really, really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd say that's probably the most um, just financially and emotionally the best payback uh, sure. that I've seen from the angel investing. Yeah, it must be so gratifying to you know work with these folks and then seeing them do really well by themselves uh, starting their own companies. But no, I, th- I think, again, that's, that's a great way to put it because a lot of founders, I think, wonder how to approach angel investing and this could be a great sort yeah. of a broad playbook, yeah, if not yeah, like yeah. very prescriptive. Um, but this is super exciting. As we as we close, I have two, three last questions. Yeah. One of the things I ask and I see founders sometimes fumble is, uh, how would your friends describe you? So if I had to <laughs> ask you that, Uman, what would, what would you say? How would my friends describe me? Uh, <laughs> It's always tricky to maintain yeah, how much is. of what they would say and know yeah, what, yeah, what. Yeah, um, I think it would be some version of like, um, some version of like, can sort of serious when I need to be serious. So can okay. sort of, um, can sort of snap on the like suddenly become serious and become unresponsive and be like heads down and then suddenly can flip into another mode. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say folks, a lot of people would definitely say that. And I don't know if it's a version of being a little intense. Like I definitely am like, you know, I can be like, all right, this is what I care about for the next few months and I can block out some of the noise. And mm-hmm. uh, I think they would say some version of that. Uh, I think, um, I, you know, I, I'm l- lucky in some ways, and maybe it goes back to some of these school friends where I can go long periods of not communicating and then just pick up, um, you know, exactly where we left off. Like, I'm not one of those people who, again, for better or for worse, needs to be in touch all the time and communicating. I can, I'm pretty, I wouldn't say I'm an introvert, but I'm definitely, um, I can definitely just like, go down a certain path and just keep going and suddenly be like, all right, it's been a while. I haven't spoken to X, Y, Z and pick up uh, where I left off. Uh, I think they say some version of that, which is he doesn't reply to messages. (laughs) I'm definitely not the most responsive at replying to to, to messages. Uh, And and I think the the last thing they'd say, which uh, I don't want to draw some big comparison to startups or anything like that, but... Uh, I would say don't take myself too seriously. Like I, mm. I, I think it's 
maybe it's a defense mechanism to like the type of work founders do sometimes, which is like, it's so intense that if you take everything seriously, you just like be unhappy, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it stretches into my own friends and personal life, which is I, I, I definitely am not a, like when I'm not thinking about work, I'm not a very serious person. I'm not a very like, um, I don't take myself too seriously and therefore I don't take people around me, which I think hopefully is a good thing. It's yeah. a little more like laid back and easygoing than intense, uh, which I think comes out just in work and otherwise I'm not, I'm a pretty like chilled person. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Not, not the answers I would No, I'm not, not, I feel like I just, nothing I, I would change, but I feel like that's the first time I've like answered that question. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, I think so much of what I'm trying to do is also help like, if the founder is thinking out loud yeah. in a conversation across me, there's so much originality yeah, that yeah, comes yeah. across. So yeah. uh, that's always a great compliment. Yeah. To I'll see. go poll my friends and <laughs> let you know. Yeah, yeah. That'd, be, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things that that leads me to is also like, I, I frame it like, what is your one superpower? Uh, and what is your like, you know, this, uh, I, I call it fear, but it's yeah. not like a fear, fear per se, but things that, you know, you maybe avoid. Right? Yeah. If you had to distinctly highlight one of those, yeah. what would that be? I think it is... Uh, a, I don't know if it's a fear, but that's a good way to put it actually, because any sort of perceived superpower can turn into like a fear as well, <laughs> yeah. uh, is that like, I need to do something with a level of urgency because like, and I don't mean time on some macro like life sense, but like time is like gonna run out. Mm. Uh, and I definitely feel a, like um, a sense of like, I can, I can just work with a level of like speed and intensity. These are for micro actions yeah. or for like macro goals? Both. Okay. Like I, and, and by that I mean like, um, you know, if I sit around for too long, like I'll just be like, what am I doing? What's the plan? For, like I need to do mm. something today. And again, it doesn't have to be like work, but I feel like I get like a little antsy. Mm. Uh, and same thing applies if I take a few month view or a year view or a two year view. I definitely keep asking myself like, well, what's going to happen in the next year? Like, how are you going to accelerate, like, whatever your plans were into this year, or into this two year, or whatever period? And so I'd say, again, both a superpower and a fear, because you could, like, sort of really keep overthinking things and being like, oh my God, like, I'm, I haven't done enough this week. I haven't done enough today. I haven't done enough this month. Uh, but that's definitely, and it applies to people around me too. So I'm mm. sure the people I manage, like, sometimes find it crazy because I'd just be like, let's just do it, like, can we do this in the next 24 hours? Can yeah. we do this in the next two days? Like, do we have to wait a week? Do we have to make a month? Um, and so I think it can be a superpower and hopefully on balance is a good thing. Uh, but definitely sometimes is a, you have to check yourself. Mm. That's a distinct one. In all of my conversations, I've not, put, not, not heard somebody articulate it that way, but a sense of urgency, urgency yeah. is, is interesting. I'd probably give it some more thought post the yeah. conversation. Um, the second last question, among and this this probably sounds a bit corny, but I don't intend on. Yeah. Uh, but is this sense of, uh, hey, how do you define ambition or impact or, or perhaps even success? Because uh, as I've, I've probably said it twice during the conversation, but it just feels like outside in, right? Like uh, if you map out your career, it feels like a series of very interesting checkboxes, which is like go to a great school, yeah. go, to, do, go to a great institution, make it C, go to a great B school, start a company, sell that company or like, you know, be at a great place, which could be, in that case, the public company, Angie, yeah. um, start another one, yeah. make money, yeah. whatnot, right? Yeah. Um, I'd love to, on a fundamental level, understand what drives you or, yeah. or whatever version of that do you want to answer. But the premise is, uh, for somebody whose life feels like a template of success, uh, how do you define it? Oof. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. I think, I guess I, 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 I did, I've, in a way, reflected on it because we had this unique moment where after the sale and after leaving Angie, I could have done anything. I had six months. Like I said, maybe it happened quickly, but I did have this moment in time where I was like, now what? Like, yeah. what am I going to do now? And I could do anything. I could. Yeah. Whatever you wanted. Right. There was like the chance. It was a fresh slate, which didn't happen for 12 years. Uh, and clearly I defaulted back into building a business. Um, and so obviously both reflected at that time and then now reflected on how did that happen and why did that happen? And to some extent, it goes back to your question, which is what's 
what's driving me like what yeah. and obviously the obvious answer which i think is true for everyone is everyone's trying to find some measure of the i don't want to be all philosophical but like some measure of like what makes them happy what keeps them ticking like yeah. what makes them feel um good at the end of the day and the the question is not like you know i guess everyone's like that would be the simple answer but not a fulfilling answer which is everyone's looking for like that like the yeah. happiness but like what gets you there mm. uh and for me it is it's a cliched answer but i think it is like some measure of always building and again that doesn't have to be a startup i think that's what like it it doesn't mean like after this i should go start something else and something else but it's definitely i think starts to mean like a i want to have um like an objective and in this case a lot of that is channeled into like how do we build keychain how do we build it to the best way possible i think there is a, a a metric of impact like the kind of businesses we're starting again is not a coincidence i think keychain and handy were both large industries with people and you know it wasn't like a again it doesn't mean there are amazing financial multi billion dollar cyber security businesses for instance yeah. but that wouldn't be a type of business that i feel like would invigorate me like for me it's like seeing like real world impact like knowing people are using your product and how they're using it and what's changing uh and so i think i go back to like building something that i could see people around me or people i interact with or whatever second degree like using and saying that was valuable and i'm going to use that and this is why it sort of help whatever it is and so uh and hopefully in the process you build a great team you have a great financial outcome all of that hopefully is obviously important i don't want to trivialize the 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 some of those goals but i think it is um it's just building something and it doesn't have to be a startup that's what i tell myself i don't know <laughs> yeah. but it it's like having a plan and then having some measure of impact and trying to say how do we do that quickly sure. uh i think is what keeps me happy i love that i love that some version of building uh, i think it's it's so so nice to almost like phrase motivation yeah. through those words yeah awesome this has been so nice i think i've been super excited the last question is a is a one that i use for most endings and, and i try to point out the the exact or not the exact one but a pivotal moment in a person's life and maybe go back then so in your case uh, the one that i could point out was the start of handy mm-hmm. right if we could go back then and this is not about again not at all about regrets yeah. it's just about condensing the wisdom that you have today and putting it back there yeah. uh, if you could you know knowing everything you know today with the last yeah. know, 13 14 years if you could just go back to that point in time and talk to yourself what would that conversation look like Um it's a great question again. Um I think I would do tell myself a few things and I think back to that moment of of starting handy it was honestly like uh one is so circumstantial right like it's very hard and I think that's the thing people should also like internalize which is everyone's unique so like every founding journey is like so unique and it's hard to say like that's exactly how someone should go found a business but for me i i would knowing what i know now i would tell myself that um you know we felt like we were going to like that was the right decision to drop out and go work on something i was fortunate you know my parents my sister etc like the people around me weren't like why are you dropping out like which mm-hmm. again if they had said that i don't think i would have it would probably yeah. weigh on my mind uh and so to some extent uh i would tell myself like yeah if you think the timing's right like what is the downside like it's the, the bigger downside is not doing something and then thinking about it and so one i'm 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 glad but i would ease some of the maybe pressure that i felt which is like what's the downside go for it do it uh the second thing i would probably uh tell myself is um some of the external noise when you're building a company is not as important which again now with the hindsight i can say that sure. when you're in it like press investors people team like everyone is just giving you so much advice you're reading things and you're just internalizing everything and i would say almost like a superpower which i didn't have and even now like sort of working on is how do you take all the information but not like just one like you know because everyone's going to give you different information like and contrasting information like mm-hmm. 
raise a lot of money, don't raise money, be capital efficient, like hire the best people, don't hire people, like do it all yourself. Like you're just gonna get all these things from smart, capable people. And so I would tell myself some version of like, be open to processing all that information, but be less swayed by it. Mm. Um, because it will just, again, easier said than done. Um, but a lot of that is noise. And there's so much noise, especially today, probably way more than even 2012, 2013. Uh, and so many people giving advice on Twitter and podcasts and uh, Instagram and all these motivational reels that it's so easy to every day be like, I should do this, I should do that, I should do this, I should do that. And I was very much caught up in that. In, in again, and some of it is helpful, but some of it is noise. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a real superpower I think now is to consume all that content and noise, take what you think is valuable, block the rest, uh, and sort of be more sort of focused on whatever it is you're doing. Lovely, lovely. I think yeah. both those pointers are super helpful. Uh, and that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Umang. I've had such an amazing time as I was listening to you. I think uh, lots to learn and you've been super articulate and the experience shows and uh, very grateful to have had this conversation because your experience of building companies is phenomenal. And I'm certain that uh, a Keychain's journey also I'll now get to see firsthand by observation. So that'll be lovely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. This was great. Awesome. Thank you. Hello. If you made it this far, you've probably watched the entire episode. And if you've done that, I'm really grateful. I and my team try to put in a lot of effort to ensure that we can bring the best quality content to you. So if you liked the episode, if you watched it thus far, my request to you is to share it with people, to subscribe to the channel, and to ensure that we can keep growing. We are everything and anything only because of you, our listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll keep bringing to you amazing content. Cheers.